I would like to join the, thank you the organizers for putting up such a nice conference. I'm, I'm really running a lot these days. Uh, I'm going to talk about the work we have done in Madrid. I, I work at the Spanish Research Council. Uh, it's a, in a small institute at the center of Madrid. And this is the work I'm going to be discussing. Small contribution to the, to the field of quantum machine learning or, or whatever this means nowadays. So this work was done actually uh, in collaboration with Eric Torontegui. He should have been giving here the talk, but he couldn't come. Uh, and what I'm, well, our origins is, is a little bit uh, different from most of the background of the audience. So we actually work mostly with quantum hardware. We work with systems such as superconducting circuits or, or trapped ions, and, and we are trying to in, in engineer these systems to, to do quantum information tasks. So our, our, our approach to, to quantum machine learning is a little bit indirect. We arrived to this field trying to find architectures that are useful for solving problems. And so we have seen talks that try to optimize uh, quantum processes using machine learning or, or uh, talks that use existing architectures to do machine learning tasks. We are trying to find something in between, trying to learn what we can do with different architectures to do uh, some machine learning ideas. Uh, well, the starting point, this has been repeated in several talks, is this idea of having a neural network, uh, starting with this uh, classical device, uh, the neurons that power our brain, which uh, people model as, as a, a nonlinear device that has a nonlinear input with respect to some uh, uh, weighted averages of the inputs that it has. So uh, the idea mathematically is very simple. You have some activation potential, uh, and you use that to, to trigger this neuron into a, an, an active or, or, or remaining in a passive state. So this has been used uh, in the last year, so with uh, great success in many applications, uh, some of them related to classification. Uh, and, and this is the, the, main, the main idea that uh, I'm going to use, is that we have these uh, networks that with some inputs that are uh, propagating some continuous numbers uh, values that are initially between zero and one, they are weighted and they are propagating through further nonlinear devices until we get to some outputs here. This would be a classification network that can really understand or at least identify features in complex systems. Like in this case, it would be identifying hand handwritten numbers. And what you see is that you have here like many different output ports of this network. And this guy is giving a value between zero and one. In this case, it's very close to one. That means that with high confidence, we identify this as being a number four. And that's, that's one application. But for me, the main idea is that essentially what I have is, is, a, is a representation, complex representation of a function with some inputs that I create combining nonlinear elements just to produce an output, which is between zero and one. This function can be arbitrarily complex. And, and this is a way of approximating those functions. And of course, this doesn't always work. You can train networks and they can identify features, but they, they, they give in confidence intervals. So they, give, they are probabilistic in a way in the, in the identification of features. So here's a deer. And of course, it looks like a deer, but there are many other examples in this training network and training a set that, that don't work very well. So one has to be careful with that. So the idea is that we use, we use these nonlinear devices for approximating actual functions that we don't really understand how they work. Uh, and this is what I'm going to be using in the talk. So I would have like a, uh, some, some function I want to approximate, and I have uh, either a stepwise or, or a smoother response function. The only thing I need is that this function goes from uh, zero to one uh, within the interval of, of inputs of the real uh, uh, axis. Uh, and once I have one of these guys, I can combine them uh, uh, to approximate uh, arbitrarily complex functions. Uh, and I can uh, optimize the weights that I use to trigger uh, these uh, these functions and the thresholds, and, and I combine them with some additional weights. And, and the output of this combined network is the, the approximation of the function I, I want to use. So this is a toy example. I, I copied somehow from uh, Andrew and G's uh, Coursera's uh, uh, course that I took a long, long time ago before all this exploded. Now we have lots of uh, powerful numerical methods to, to work with these systems. So our contribution in this field comes from uh, an application that I will show later on in this talk. And it's to, to, to map this idea of activation to a quantum device. Uh, and the idea is, is, is very stupid. So basically, we have uh, that our original network has some probability of being active. It's a function p of some input, in this case, x. And I'm going to map uh, the, the, the state of uh, this classical state of being active or, or passive, or activated or resting with some probability to a quantum state. So with some probability p, my neuron is going to be excited. And with some probability 1 minus p is going to remain at the zero state. Essentially, this, this neuron is a qubit. 
And there will be some input field. I'm not going to talk about it right now, but this is going to be an input field that's going to activate my qubit. And this is a recipe, essentially, for, for how this neuron is going to work. And now what we want to do is we want to transform this recipe into a unitary operation. And, and that's, uh, that's a little bit tricky. So in principle, this, this shouldn't need to be unitary. I'm only giving you here one vector, but I can compute the other one. I can show that this can be a unitary transformation. And that's essentially what we do in, in this uh, manuscript. And, and the, the, actually, the idea is very simple. It's something that you find again and again in quantum optics. So this is the, this is the ground state uh, uh, picture of a, of a two-level system subject to two magnetic fields, uh, one parallel and one transverse to the, to the two-level system. And what I do is I fix Vx, and I scan the values of Vz. And you see that as I, as I switch Vz from very negative numbers to very positive numbers, the probability of being in the one state of the qubit uh, switches nonlinearly. And this is what we are going to use, essentially. So we will have this uh, two-level system scheme. The dashed lines uh, are the energy levels uh, in absence of this uh, tunneling element. And then we have here a gap, which, is, which happens exactly at the transition point. And we are going to, to work with these um, magnetic fields to essentially prepare a ground state that has this uh, sigmoidite response function. So uh, I prepared this uh, animation here. You see that as we switch Vx from a very large value to a small value, this goes from being a superposition of, uh, of two states. Uh, this should be repeated again. So we, we start with a very small, I am showing you the, the very small uh, magnetic field. And this could be, whoop. So if the magnetic field is very small, we have a linear profile. But if, we, uh, if I st stop at a very large transverse magnetic field, I have essentially an equal superposition of the zero and one states. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to work backwards. So I'm going to start here. I'm going to start with a very large Vx uh, with a state that I can prepare very efficiently. It's just a superposition of zero and one. You can do it with a Hadamard. And then I'm going to simply. Uh, uh, switch uh, the magnetic field downwards until I reach this, uh, uh, this nonlinear activation uh, function. So this is essentially uh, something that you can do uh, uh, adiabatically or quasi-adiabatically. The, the, the external field now is going to be the field exerted by, by my input neurons. And I'm going to modulate this guy from a very large uh, omega value down to a, a smaller value that defines essentially what is the size of the, the step that we have here. And this, we can do this linearly. You can simply ramp in a certain time uh, from your quantum optics books or your quantum mechanics uh, books. I mean, you, you know that essentially we can do it very fast. Essentially, this is limited by the, by the smallest gap that we have here. Uh, and that was our original idea. So we, 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 we took uh, this approach of, uh, of doing this ramp uh, with the magnetic field. and. Uh, And it, it worked, but it didn't work very well. So these are, these are numbers that we put, uh, assuming that you could do the implementation with the superconducting circuit. Uh, and you see that, well, it, yes, it, it goes to 1. This is, would be fidelity 1 with respect to the sigmoid activation function that you have there. But it, it's not really fast. Uh, and the reason why it's not very good is because um, this linear ramp uh, is not optimized. So one thing that you can do is you can estimate an adiabatic condition that is simply how good you satisfy, satisfy the adiabatic theorem is defined by the, the, the overlap between the, your states and also the gap, the, the instantaneous gap that you have. Uh, and we have seen that this, this number is not very good. So we can, what we can do is we can uh, switch this guy optimally, design the profile omega of t to, to increase the fidelity of, of, uh, and the speed up with which we, we prepare this gate. And so this is what we did. Uh, Eric uh, is, has been working on many quasi-adiabatic protocols. This is one of them, fast quasi-adiabatic uh, uh, passage. We impose the, that this ratio is constant. And this constant is going to define how well we are satisfied the adiabatic theorem. And once you have this, you have an dif ordinary differential equation that you can solve. And you see that this is the, the linear profile of the ramp of the transverse magnetic field that we had originally. And this is the optimal one. And the adiabatic condition is much better satisfied with shorter times. And the fidelity is very high. And one thing I want to clarify is that this is an adiabatic passage, but what we are doing here is a quantum gate. So this is not 
uh, quantum state preparation. We, you can start with any initial state. You apply this uh, protocol of having a very large surface magnetic field and ramping it down. And what you have is a unitary operation. Uh, and this unitary operation somehow sits in between uh, two paradigms. We have seen lots of uh, talks talking about uh, both feed-forward neural networks, where you have this notion of uh, going from one place to another. This guy activates as input of these guys. And also uh, uh, Boltzmann machines, which are quasi-static picture of, of interacting spins. And what we're doing is we are taking these kind of models, and we are using them to sequentially activate neurons in a, in a nonlinear fashion. So, but with unitary operations, which is, uh, for, for me, it was a little bit surprising that you could do this uh, unitarily. Uh, after, afterwards, there have been other contributions well, contemporarily in the last year uh, that show that you cannot do it with other procedures, but it's kind of interesting that you can, you can do these neural networks-like devices in a unitary fashion without uh, measurements or, or feedback. Uh, the, of course, the unitary evolution is linear, and you may wonder if this evolution is linear, where does the nonlinearity of the network come from? And, and to find that nonlinearity, you have to look at the Heisenberg picture, not as state, but as observables. And you will see that the, 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 the expectation value of sigma set at the output neuron uh, is a nonlinear function of the, uh, of the input states of the, of the neurons that feed it. So the, actually, the response in terms of observable is really nonlinear. Uh, and this happens both uh, with classical inputs. If you have here classical inputs, the product states, your behavior is really like a classical neural network. But you can also feed it with superpositions, and we, well, it would be interesting to investigate what happens in those contexts and how this can be fed into different applications. Uh, another interesting thing is that, uh, as I told you, this is a gate. So there's nothing that prevents you from doing it again and again. And if you do it multiple times, Essentially, what you're doing is a unitary operation, which is generated by a lot of nonlinear functions. So what you have in the exponent of your unit, or unitary that activates this neuron is, in principle, a general function of your input neurons. G can be anything. And as we know from classical neural networks, I can uh, engineer these uh, activations and these weights and these thresholds to good, uh, get a good approximation of any function I can think of of my input neurons. So this, this is a way of doing very complex quantum gates. Uh, and, and, and we have tested it uh, as a little bit of fun just to also to learn how to tens tensor no tensorflow works. We, we feed this kind of neurons uh, into, the, into the Python code. And we optimize response functions for a step, uh, like this kind of rectangular responses or triangular responses that, that are implemented really weird quantum gates. So in general, you can think of this as a way of implementing uh, kind of general oracle of, uh, in which you, you fit some information, some complex nonlinear function of your qubits to, to one witness qubit. This can be used to do specific gates. In, in particular, I mean, this, this kind of uh, activation potentials can be used to do control nodes. It can be used to do short gates. It can be used multi-qubit multi control nodes. And, but in principle, the family of gates you can do is, is much, much broader than it would originally seem. So in principle, we, we, we see this as a uh, one more gate that you can add to the two books of quantum computing. And there have been people that have been studying the, the power of non-local gates, like Mormon Sorensen, that can be useful for simulating fermion existence. But now we have another different way of doing gates that could be useful for, for other algorithms. Of course, this is very nice that also you can do it in a very efficient way with multiple layers of, of, of neurons that you can reuse and reset. So in principle, we are now trying to investigate what would be the, the right architectures to to implement this kind of, of quantum operations. But actually, our original motivation was a little bit different. And this is another application of, of these quantum machine learning ideas. Actually, we were trying to investigate how to build uh, more complex quantum sensors. So imagine I have a, a complex object that has some property that I want to investigate. I normally don't have access to this object. I simply have access to, uh, to the field it generates. And, and normally what people do is they put sensors and they investigate the values of the fields. But I'm not interested in the field. I'm interested in the origin of that field. So I'm interested in some property that is here. And the field is a function of that property. But I'm not interested in the field itself. I'm interested in Q. So one indirect way of operating would be to use these sensors, use quantum sensing approaches uh, to determine the states of all these qubits independently and to infer phi and then do a classical inversion of this function to get value of Q. 
Well, what we can do, uh, uh, well, this would be the, the procedure. So you essentially have a function, a, in principle, a complex function that is a function of the qubits that we have here, and we, you would replace it with expectation values. Uh, but there is now, with this idea of nonlinear gates, another way of doing that. We can do uh, this uh, neural networks approach to uh, activate uh, an, uh, an, an additional sensor in a nonlinear function uh, of the, all the qubits that you have here. And this function, we can decompose it into individual uh, neural network type activation potentials. So in principle, this function can be approximated to arbitrary uh, degree using simply these gates. So in a way, we, we are uh, probing with a single guy uh, a property that was mediated by these quantum sensors. And of course, in the process, we create a lot of entanglement. But actually, this could be a way of improving the precision and the, the efficiency of some complex sensing schemes. So this, this is an idea that, I mean, that we can use perhaps quant machine learning for other things that are not just optimizing experiments, but finding new ways of doing other stuff that is right now is not possible. And this fits very naturally into existing setups that are investigated, for instance, in Harvard, where they have MB centers and, and the, the surface of the, of the diamond is populated by impurities or it can be functionalized. This would be the actual sensors, and they are interrogated by a single MB center that can be a very, very efficiently talked to individually to each of them. If instead of talking individually to each of them, they, it talks to a collective uh, of sensors, you can get uh, some kind of uh, better imaging device for fields, for uh, uh, shapes of molecules, or magnetic fields, and so on. And so this brings me to the application. So where, where can you make these gates nowadays? Of course, if, since this comes from a spin-spin interaction, an ICM model with a, with a control, uh, control magnetic field, one platform would be a D-Wave machine, where you have lots of qubits with connectivity. But another platform that is very natural for this is trapped ions. You can put uh, a number of ions in a trap, and those ions, uh, they, they, they can implement an icing model when they are subject to transverse magnetic fields that uh, make the ions interact. So there, there are many systems where this could be uh, simplified. Uh, we are also testing ideas of different platforms. I told you we try to find new uh, paradigms of, of hardware where this could work. And one, one promising way is to put qubits talking to, to each other through pho propagating photons where we have shown that you can really find icing models uh, and they can be controlled efficiently by controlling the bosonic medium. That is, this could be a way of introducing long-range interactions in superconducting circuits and, and implementing these, these gates efficiently. Uh, I've led intentionally this discussion about uh, what this is useful for and what is the exponential advantage. That's something I'm really not interested in. So what I'm interested in is, is trying to find new ideas like these quantum perceptron gates that uh, bring new tools to the quantum information realm, and it can also be investigated with new types of hardware. And of course, I, I, I have to thank the, my collaborators, in this case, Eric, who put all this effort into designing the, the neural network controllers, and we discussed long about these ideas. And yes, we'll welcome your questions. OK, yeah, thank you. Uh, we have a question. Um, just a little fun note. Uh, I always hoped if someone has a nice perceptron model, they would start calling it a Qron. <laughs> I thought like a qubit neuron would be like a cool name for it. So it is like that. But I actually have a question. I just got a little bit confused. Sorry. Maybe um, uh, right at the beginning. So if your B field is your input, but that's a classical variable. So I, I, I don't understand how you get coherence then if you build larger structures. Maybe I'll. Yeah. Do you, do you know what, I'm, what I mean? So um, this would be essentially what we are doing. Uh, yeah. You have uh, an icing model with a transverse magnetic field. Uh, and the moment you have this transverse magnetic field, you create coherence between uh, your neuron and your, and your input, uh, input fields. So in a sense, that the, the other neurons is just simply a mean field. Uh, it's simply a classical field, as you say. This is determined by, in the computational basis by different weighted real numbers, and that's it. So that's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's classical. This, this number is classical. But the, the state that you have in the end is, can be a superposition state, uh, depending on when I mean, it can be completely rested, zero, for some 
values of this classical field. It can be completely activated for other values. And in the middle, you have a superposition between both probabilities. Uh, uh, yeah, if I may ask, so if you then would take that uh, Curon or whatever to feed it into another qubit, how yeah. would you do that? Don't you have to measure it out, make another magnetic field classically, and then feed it in so again? So in principle, uh, so it, yeah, we haven't investigated how this translates into a deeper circuit. What we know is that um, already with two layers, this reproduces the uh, theorems that uh, uh, show that a neural network can be a universal approximator. So in principle, all those ideas that tell you that you can decompose a function into these activation potentials work already at, at, at the two-layer level. So you have your input and your but, output. But even for two layers, you need an input layer, a hidden layer, and an output layer. So you have to yeah, at least well, the take output, a neuron and yeah, feed the, it into the next layer, But right? the output layer is simple because you have only one qubit that can combine multiple functions of, of the inputs. So that's, that's uh, we don't need to add additional neurons for the, uh, for the linear weighted combination of those functions. Yeah, only one qubit can do it. But it would be interesting to know what happens when you have more layers and you propagate quantum mechanically along there. But that's something that we don't know how to do right now. Uh, I also would like, would like to uh, acknowledge that, I mean, this idea is, uh, has been investigated in other ways by other groups, like uh, the group of Nielsen Kim did a discrete version of this step potential, and, and the group of Alan Aspuru, which is this similar quantum gate. And, and it's really not trivial what happens when you nest them, uh, but we know that at least one layer provides you with with one thing that at least is useful in the context of quantum sensing. It would be interesting to know what happens quantum mechanically when you have more layers. Great, yeah, thank you. So any other question? Juanjo? Okay, so if not, so let's thank Juanjo and the, all the speakers in the, in the session before we pick for lunch.